Bing bong, bing bong, bing bong, bing bong. Welcome to Bud Mouse. This is Joe, the bearded historian. He'll tell you an interesting history. Be careful of his soldiers. They can be brats. This is Angel. She's an entity. She'll cause chaos and plant her hands at you. This is Sue. She likes spirits, not the alcohol. She's the reason this channel exists. This is David. He likes fire trucks. He's here occasionally. Bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong. We preserve his story. Good morning, people. Well, sort of. Hey. Um, let's see. Set. Ready? Here we go. I'll put it over. Start. There we go. There we go, duckies. Let's see what we got. Duckies, 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 duckies. I see a Frugal. I see a Michael. I see Naomi. I see Tab. There's Carolina. I see Patty sneaking up. There's Scully. There's Pedro's, and there's one of our bells. We have two bells now. Oh, Pedro's is getting the lead. Go, Pedro! I see Logan's. Logan's are catching up. Look for Pedro. <laughs> oh, here comes Scully. Oh, 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 there does come catching up. Oh, we gotta be taking over. Uh, there's Sheila. Oh, I think Sheila's gonna get it. That yeah, looks like Sheila got it. Oh, hold on. I'll pause this. And I'll pause. Are you ready? Fill out of time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so I support you. This shout out is for our friend. Oh, Sheila's. Alright, Sheila Family Channel is at less than 400. And. Description reads, outdoor videos, hiking in the forest, exploring nature, enjoying ourselves, traveling full time, our mom looking for Bigfoot, looking for gold. Videos are about having fun and seeing new things. So kind of like us, although I don't think we'll ever see Bigfoot and Black Hills. May mm, might have Black someday. If we do, it's going to be teeny tiny nugget. Um, but if you, uh, please check out Sheila and like, share, comment, let me know what you have you buy. Have a good day. All right, Mr. Bud. I put that over there so you could lay on it if you wanted to. Yeah, if you turn it, or it just switch it right there. It's right there. I wasn't sure what temperature you wanted. I didn't want to choose my temperature for you. Uh, it's not lighting up. Is it plugged in? No, it must not have been all the way plugged in. Still not plugged in. Oh, there it goes. Yes, it is. It just, you flipped it the wrong way. Well, it was all the way up at high, and it wasn't on, so that's why I turned it back down to low to back up. All right. Uh, go. Go. Now, bearded historian, today we are going to talk about something that we all need, and, well, not drugs, but uh, uh -huh. medicine. Now. Medicine is drugs. Technically. Some is just, you know, quackery, but that's beside the point. Now... Let's go ahead and go all the way back to the caveman days. You know, we Captain prehistoric medicine. Oh, yep, there you go. Um, you know, prehistoric medicine is a field of study focusing on the understanding of the use of medicinal plants, healing practices, illnesses, and the wellness of humans before written records existed. Although styled prehistoric medicine, uh, prehistoric healthcare practices were vastly different from what we understand medicine to be. In the present era, and more accurately refers to studies in the exploration of early healing practices. Well, this period, period extends across the first use of stone tools by early humans 3.3 uh, million years ago to the beginning of writing systems and subsequent recorded history 5,000 years ago. Well, as human populations were once scattered across the world, forming isolated communities and cultures that sporadically interacted, a range of archaeological periods 
have been developed to account for different contexts of technology, uh, social culture, cultural developments, and the uptake of writing systems throughout early human societies. Prehistoric medicine is then highly contextual to the location and people in question, uh, creating a ununiform period of study to reflect various degrees of societal development. For example, what might work in North America at that time wasn't even known of in Europe. So, without these written records, insights into prehistoric medicine comes indirectly from interpreting evidence left behind by prehistoric humans. One branch of this includes the archaeology of medicine, a discipline that uses a range of archaeological techniques from observing illness in human remains, plant fossils, to excavations to un uncover medical practices. There are evidence of healing practices within Neanderthals and other early human species, prehistoric evidence of human engagement with medicine, such as the discovery of psychoactive plants like the pilocybin mushrooms in 6000 uh, Sahara to primitive dental care in uh, 10900 uh, before uh, Common Era. Ripardo Friend, present day, present day Italy, and 700 uh, before Common Era, Megararth, present day Pakistan. Now, anthropology is another academic branch that contributes to the understanding of prehistoric medicine and uncovering the social cultural relationships, meaning, and interpretation of the prehistoric evidence. The overlap of medicine is both a route to healing the body as well as the spiritual throughout prehistoric periods highlights the multiple purposes that healing practices and plants could potentially have. Uh, from proto-religions that developed spiritual systems, relationships of humans and supernatural entities, from gods to shamans, have played an interwoven part in the prehistoric medicine. Now, ancient history basically covers the time from 3000 before Common Era to 500 Common Era, starting from evidence development of the writing systems to the end of the Classical Era, beginning of post-classical period. This Perio Station presents history as it were the same everywhere. However, it's important to note that socioculture and technological developments could differ locally from settlement to settlement as well as globally from one society to the next. Ancient medicine covers a similar period of time and presented a range of similar healing theories from across the world connecting nature, religion, and humans within the ideas of circulating fluids and energy. Although prominent scholars and texts detailed well-defined medical insights, their real-world applications were marred by knowledge destruction and loss, poor communication, localized reinterpretations, and the subsequent inconsistent applications. Ed doesn't know what he's reading about. Is he supposed to know? Well, he should. He's the doctor. Oh, dear. Now, the Mesopotamian region, covering most of present-day Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Iran, and Turkey, was dominated by a series of civilizations, including Sumer, the earliest known civilization in the Fertile Crescent region, Alongside the Arcadians, uh, including Assyrians and Babylonians, overlapping ideas that we understand as medicine, science, magic, and religion are characterized early Mesopotamian healing practices as a hybrid naturalistic and supernatural belief system. Ooh, supernatural. Well, fun questions. The Sumerians, having developed one of the earliest known writing systems in the third millennium uh, before Christian era, created numerous cuneiform clay tablets regarding their civilization, including detailed accounts of drug prescriptions, operations, to exorcisms. These were administered and carried out by highly defined professionals, including seers, exorcists, and physician priests. An example of an early prescription-like medication appeared in Sumerian during the third dynasty of Ur, uh, dating around to 2004 before Common Era. Following the conquest of the Sumerian civilization by the Arcadian Empire, and the empire's eventual collapse from a number of social and environmental factors, the Babylonian civilization began to dominate the region. The examples of Babylonian medicine included an extensive Babylonian medical text, the Diagnostic Handbook, sounds like you're working on a car, uh, <laughs> written Maybe by... Maybe we are cars. Very possible. Written by uh, Chief Scholar Esclaquin Apley of Porsipa, in the middle of the 11th century, before Common Era, during the reign of the Babylonian king Adad Apla Edina, uh, who passed away in 1046 before Common Era. Oh, no. This medical treaty uh, presented the great attention to the practice of diagnosis, prognosis, physical examination, and remedies. Sounds almost modern. 
Almost. Uh, the text contains a list of medical symptoms that are often detailed uh, empirical observations along with logical rules used in combining observed symptoms of a body of a patient with its diagnosis and prognosis. However, here, clearly developed rationales were developed to understand the causes of disease and injury, supported by agreed-upon theories at the time of elements we might now understand as natural causes, supernatural magic, and religious explanation. Uh, most known and recovered artifacts from the ancient Mesopotamian civilizations center on the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian periods, as their empires ruled by native Mesopotamian rulers. These discoveries include a huge array of medical clay tablets from this period, although damage to the clay documents creates large gaps in our understanding of medical practices. Throughout the civilizations of Mesopotamia, there are a wide range of medical innovations, including evidence practices of prophylactics, taking measures to prevent the spread of disease, accounts of stroke, to an awareness of mental illnesses. Ooh, well, so, somebody was aware of it. Yeah, they, they, they were cracking codes long before, you know, the Dark Ages. Well, ancient Egypt, not one to slough off, a uh, civilization spanning across the river Nile, uh, existed from its unification to its collapse via the Persian conquest in 525 before Common Era, and ultimately the downfall uh, from the conquest of Alexander the Great in 332 before Common Era. Throughout unique dynasties, golden eras, and intermittent periods of instability, ancient Egyptians developed a complex experimental and communicative, communicative medical tradition that has been uncovered through surviving documents, most made of papyrus, such as the Cahoon Gynecological Papyrus, the Edwin Smith Papyrus, the Ebers Papyrus, the London Medical Papyrus, to the Greek Magical Papyri. Herodontus described the Egyptians as the healthiest of all men next to the Libyans because of the dry climate and the notable public health system that they possessed. According to him, the practices of medicine is so specialized among that each physician is a healer of one disease and no more. Well, that's kind of uh, sophisticated. In a way, it makes sense because you specialize in that one disease. But yeah, you if know? You, you think about it, the world's a big place. You can't have just one doctor who knows how to cure this this yeah. thing. I'm sorry, I can't see you. I've got 23 patients in front of you. Please hold. Oh, he just fell over dead. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so what we got is, although Egyptian medicine, to the considerable extent, dealt with the supernatural, it eventually developed a practical use in the fields of anatomy, public health, and clinical diagnostics. Medical information in the Edwin Smith papyrus may date to a time as early as 3000 uh, BCE. Inhotep in the Third Dynasty is sometimes credited with being the founder of ancient Egyptian medicine and with the detailing cures, ailments, and anatomical observations. The Edwin Smith papyrus is regarded as a copy of several earlier works and was written in 1600 uh, before Common Era. It is an ancient textbook on surgery, almost completely devoid of magical thinking, and describes in exquisite detail the examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of numerous ailments. Uh, the Cahoon gynecological papyrus treats women's complaints, including problems with conception. 34 cases de detailing diagnosis and treatment survive, some of them fragmentally. Dating to 1800, it is the oldest surviving medical text of any kind. Medical institutions, referred to as houses of life, are known to have been established in ancient Egypt as early as 2200 before Common Era. The Ebers papyrus is the oldest medical text written mentioning enemas. Uh, many medications were administered by enemas, and one of the many types of medical specialists was an eerie, the shepherd of the anus. Oh! oh. Shepherd of the anus. Yes. The earliest known physician is also credited with ancient Egypt, Hesri Ra, chief of dentists and physicians for King Dezozer in the 27th century uh, before Common Era. Also, the earliest known woman physician, Pishiet, practiced in ancient Egypt at the time of the Fourth Dynasty. Her title was Lady Overseer of the Lady Physicians. And as you continue to go around the world... I'm surprised she wasn't a nun. Yeah, no kidding. Seems like that was a, that, that a position been... for uh, someone from the nuns. Yeah, nunnery. Because they didn't do any... Or maybe that's where nuns originally came from, is that... You maybe. Because a lot of the hospitals up here, we'll talk about later had uh, their starts with uh, nuns 
journeying uh, distances to set up in Bedwood and Rapid. Now, medical and healing practices in early Chinese dynasties were heavily shaped by the practice of traditional Chinese medicine starting around the Zhao dynasty, dynasty. Parts of this system were being developed and demonstrated in early writings on the herbs in Classic of Changes and the Classic of Poetry. China also developed a large body of traditional medicine. Much of this philosophy of traditional Chinese medicine derived from the empirical observations of disease and illness by Taoist physicians and reflects classical Chinese belief that individual human experiences express caustic cost, principles effective in the environment at all scales. These principles, whether material, essential, or mystical, correlate as an expression of the natural order of the universe. The foundational text of Chinese medicine is the uh, roughly translated Yellow Emperor's Inner Canon, written in 5th century to 3rd century uh, before Common Era. Near the end of the 2nd century, uh, during the Han Dynasty, Zhang Zhuangling wrote the Treatise on Cold Damage, which contains the earliest known reference to the Najing Suan. The Jin Dynasty practitioner and advocate of acupuncture and Max Devotion, Hong Fu Mi, also quotes the Yellow Emperor in his Zhang Jing on page 265. During the Tang Dynasty, the Suan was expanded and revised and is now the best extent representation of the foundational roots of traditional Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine that is based on the use of herbal medicine, acupuncture, massage, and other forms of therapy that has been practiced in China for thousands of years. Now, over to India, the Atharvada, a sacred text of Hinduism dating from the early Iron Age, is one of the first Indian texts dealing with medicine. The Atharvada also contains prescriptions of herbs for various ailments. The use of herbs to treat ailments would later form a large part of this uh, Ayurveda. Ayurveda, meaning the complete knowledge for a long life, is another medical system in India. Its two most famous texts belong to the school of Chakra and Sharuta. The earliest foundation of the Ayurveda was built on the synthesis of traditional herbal practices together with a massive addition of theor theoretical conceptualizations, new nosologies, and new therapies dating from about 600 before Common Era onwards and coming out of their communities of thinkers which included the Buddha and others. According to the Compendium of Chakra, the Sharka Micha Health and disease are not predetermined, and life may be prolonged by human effort. The Compendium of Sasruta, the Sasruta Shita, defines the purpose of medicine and cure, the diseases of the sick, protect the healthy, and to prolong life. Both of these ancient compendium include details of the examination, diagnosis, treatment, the prognosis of numerous ailments, the Sasruta Mita, is notable for describing procedures of various forms of surgery, including rhinoplasty, the repair of torn earlobes, perianal lithotomy, cataract surgery, and several other excisions and other surgical procedures. Most remarkable was Sosrucho's surgery, especially the rhinoplasty, for which he is called the father of modern plastic surgery. Sosrucho also describes more than 125 surgical instruments in the details, also remarkable is Sushruta's penchant for scientific classification. His medical treatise consists of 184 chapters, 1,120 conditions are listed, including injuries and illnesses related to aging and mental illness. This is from ancient India. The Ayurvedic classics mention eight branches of medicine, uh, internal medicine, surgery including anatomy, eye, ear, nose, and throat diseases, uh, pediatrics with obst obstetrics and gynecology, spirit and psychiatric medicine, toxicology with treatments of stings and bites, science of rejuvenation, aphrodisiac and fertility. Apart from learning these, the student of Ayurveda was expected to know ten arts that are indispensable in the preparation and application of his medicines. Uh, distillation, Operative skills, cooking, horticulture, metallurgy, sugar manufacture, pharmacy, analysis and separation of minerals, compounding of metals, metals, and the preparation of alkalis. Sounds almost like the National Guard. Well, if you bring you in for the National Guard, you're going to learn a trade. 
You have to know this and this that, and this that, and this that. and this. Why? Because he said so. Yeah. The teaching of various subjects was done during the instruction of the relevant clinical subjects, for example. The teaching of anatomy was part of the teaching of surgery. Embryology was part of the training in pediatrics and obstetrics. And the knowledge of psychology and pathology was interwoven in the teaching of clinical disciplines. The normal length of a student's training appears to have been about seven years, but the phys physician was to continue to learn. As an alternative form of medicine in India, Unani medicine found deep roots in royal patronage during the medieval times. It progressed during the Indian Sultanate and Mughal periods. Unani medicine is very close to the Ayurveda. Both are based in the theory of the presence of the elements. In Unani, they are considered to be fire, water, earth, and air in the human body. According to the followers of Unani medicine, the elements are present in different fluids, and their balance leads to health, and their imbalance leads to illness. By the 18th century uh, common era, Sanskrit medical wisdom still dominated. Muslim rulers built large hospitals in 1595 in Hyderabad and in Delhi in 1719, and numerous uh, commentaries were on ancient texts were written. Now, ancient Greek medicine, uh, this one, is I don't think it's supposed to be funny, but it sounds funny. Mm. Humors. Humors. The theory of humors was derived from the ancient medical works, dominated Western medicine until the 19th century, and is credited to the Greek philosopher and surgeon Galen of Pergamon, in Greek medicine, there are thought to be four humors or bodily fluids that are linked with illness. What? I was going to say, maybe that's where the, the term uh, laughter is the best medicine. Never mind. Wrong type of humors. I was going to say, it, it worked for me for a minute there. Uh, bodily fluids that are linked to illness. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Well then. Yes. Early scientists believe that food is digested into blood, muscle, and bones, while the humors that weren't blood were then deformed by the indigestible materials that are left over. An excess or shortage of any one of the four humors is theorized to have caused an imbalance in the resultant sickness. The aforementioned statement is hypothesized by sources before Hippocrates. Hippocrates deducted that the four seasons of the year and the four ages of man that affect the body are in relation to the humors. The four ages of man are childhood, youth, prime age, and old age. The four humors then associated with the four seasons are black bile for autumn, yellow bile for, spring, for summer, phlegm for winter, and blood spring. In the Temperamentus, Galen linked what he called temperaments or personality characteristics to a person's natural mixture of humors. He also said that the best place to check the balance of temperaments was the palm of the hand. A person that is considered to be phlegmatic is said to be an introvert, even-tempered, calm, and peaceful. The person with an excess of phlegm, which is described as a viscous substance of mucus, similarly a melancholic temperament related to being moody, anxious, depressed, introverted, and pessimistic. A melancholic temperament is, is caused by the excess of black bile, which is sedimentary and dark in color. Being extroverted, talkative, easygoing, carefree, and sociable concedes with a sanguine temperament, which is linked to too much blood. You poor vampires. Finally, a choleric temperament is related to too much yellow bile, which is actually red in color, and has the texture of foam. It is associated with being aggressive, excitable, impulsive, and extroverted. There are numer way, numerous ways to treat the disproportion of the humors. For example, if someone is suspected of having too much blood, the physician would perform bloodletting as a treatment. Likewise, if a person has too much phlegm, he would be better after expirating, which is spitting, when someone with too much yellow bile would purge. Another factor to be considered in the balance of humors is the quality of air in which one resides, such as the climate and elevation. After the standard food and drink, balance of sleeping and walking, exercise and rest, retention and evacuation are important. Moods such as anger, sadness, joy, and love can also affect the balance. During that time, the importance of balance was demonstrated by the fact that women lose blood during menstruation and have a lesser occurrence of gout, arthritis, and epilepsy than men do. Galen, oh, yeah. Galen also hypothesized that there were three faculties. The natural faculty affects growth and reproduction and is produced in the liver. Animal and vital fa faculty uh, controls respiration and emotion coming from the heart. In the brain, the psychic faculty commands the senses and thought. And the structure of bodily function is related to the humors as well. 
Greek physicians understood that food was cooked in the was cooked in the stomach. This is where the nutrients are extracted. The best, most potent, and pure nutrients from food are reserved for blood, which is produced in the liver and carried through veins to organs. Blood enhanced with pneuma, uh, which means wind or breath, is carried by the arteries. The path that the blood takes is as follows. Venous blood passes through the vena cava and moves into the right ventricle of the heart. Then the pulmonary artery takes it to the lungs. Later, pulmonary vein mixes air from the lungs with blood to form arterial blood, which has different observable, observable characteristics. After leaving the liver, half of the yellow bile that's produced travels to the blood. The other half travels to the gallbladder. Similarly, half the black bile produced gets mixed with the blood, and the other half is used by the spleen. Now, around 800 uh, before our common era, Homer of the Iliad gives description of wound treatment by the two sons of Asclepios, the admiral physicians Poldelarius Pol and Machon, and the one acting daughter, one acting doctor, Patroclus. Because Machron is wounded and Podarchus is in combat, Eurylipus asks Patroclus to cut out the arrowhead and wash the dark blood from my thigh with warm water and sprinkle soothing herbs with power to heal on my wound. Our Klaskios, like Inohep, came to be associated with the god of healing over time. Temples uh, dedicated to the healer god, Asclepius, known as Asclea, uh, functioned as centers of medical advice, prognosis, and healing. At these shrines, patients would enter a dreamlike state of induced sleep known as Encolmesius, not unlike anesthesia, in which they would receive guidance from a deity in a dream or were cured by surgery. Asclepia provided careful control, controlled spaces, conductive to healing, and fulfilled several of the requirements of institutions created for healing. In the Aspileon of Eurapides, lar three large marble boards dated to 350 before Common Era preserved the names, case histories, complaints, and cures about 70 patients who came to the temple with a problem and shed it there. Some of the surgical cures listed, such as the opening of an abdominal abscess or the removal of traumatic foreign materials, are realistic enough to have taken place, but with the patient in a state uh, induced with the help of sulfuric substances, such as opium, uh, Akamarian of Croton wrote uh, medicine between 500 and 450 before Common Era. He argued that the channels within the sensory organs of the brain, and it is possible that he discovered one type of channel, the optic nerves, by dissection. Now, Hippocrates of Kos, considered the father of modern medicine, the Hippocratic Corpus is a collection of around 70 early medical works from ancient Greece strongly associated with Hippocrates and his students. Most famously, Hippocrates invented the Hippocratic Oath for Physicians. Contemporary physicians swear an oath of office that includes aspects found in the early editions of the Hippocratic Oath. Now, Hippocrates and his fellow followers were the first to describe many diseases and medical conditions through humorism or hum humorialism as a medical system predates 5th century Greek medicine, Hippocrates and his students syst systematized the thinking that illness can be explained by an imbalance of blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. Hippocrates was also given credit for the first description of clubbing on the fingers, an important diagnostic sign in chronic superlative lung disease, lung cancer, and cyanotic heart disease. For this reason, clubbed fingers are sometimes referred to as Hippocratic fingers. Hippocrates was also the first physician to describe the Hippocratic face in prognosis. Shakespeare famously alludes to this description when writing of Falstaff's death in Act II, Scene Three of Henry V. Hippocrates began to categorize illnesses as acute, chronic, endemic, and epidemic, and used such terms as exasperation, relapse, resolution, crisis, paroxysm, peak, and convalescence. The Greek Galen was one of the greatest physicians of the ancient world as his theories dominated all medical studies for nearly 1,500 years. His theories and experimentation laid the foundation of modern medicine surrounding the heart and blood. Ooh. Galen's influence and innovations of medicine can be attributed 
Two of the experiments he conducted and were unlike any other medical experiments at his time. Galen strongly believed that medical dissertation was one of the essential procedures in truly understanding medicine. He began to dissect different animals that were anatomically similar to humans, which allowed him to learn more about the internal organs and then extrapolate the surgical studies to the human body. In addition, he performed many that were considered audacious operations, including brain and eye surgeries that were not tried again for almost two millennia. Wow. Yeah. Through the dissections and surgical procedures, Galen concluded that blood is able to circulate throughout the human body. The heart is most similar to the human soul. In Ars Medica, or Arts of Medicine, he further explains that medical properties, mental properties in terms of specific mixtures of the bodily organs, while much of his work surrounded the physical anatomy, he also worked heav heavily in the humoral physiology. Galen's medical work is regarded as authoritative until well into the Middle Ages. He left a physiological model of the human body that became the mainstay of medieval physicians' university anatomy curriculum. Although they attempted to extrapolate the an animal dissections towards the model of the human body, some of Galen's theories were incorrect. This caused... Uh, his model to suffer greatly from stasis and intellectual stagnation. Greek and Roman taboos caused the section of the human body to usually be banned in ancient times, but in the Middle Ages it changed. Uh, in 1523, Galen's On Natural Faculties was published in London, and in 1530, Belgian anatomist and physician Andreas Valesius launched a project to translate many of Galen's Greek texts into Latin. Uh, here comes our Latin, kids. Uh oh Valencia's most famous work, De Humanis Corpus Fabrica, was greatly influenced by the Galenic writing and form. Now, two great Alexandrians laid the foundation for scientific study in anatomy and physiology. Uh, Heterophilius of Chalcedon and Erastiasus of Sios. Uh, other surgeons gave us ligature, hemostasis, lithiotomy, hernia operations. Come back here. No. Ophthalmic surgery, plastic surgery, methods of reduction of dislocations and fractures, tracheotomy, and mandrake as an anesthetic. Some of what we know comes from Celsus and Galen of Pergamum. Now, Herophilus, the renowned Alexandrian physician, was one of the pioneers of human anatomy. Through his knowledge of anatom anatomical structure of the human body was vast. He specialized in the aspects of neural anatomy. Thus, his experimentation was centered around the anatomical composition of the blood vascular system and pulsations that can be analyzed from the system. Furthermore, the surgical experimentation he administered caused him to become very prominent through the field of medicine as he was one of the first physicians to initiate the exploration and dissection of the human body. The banned practice of human dissection was lifted during his time with the scholastic community. This brief moment in the history of Greek medicine allowed him to further study the brain, which is believed to be the core of the nervous system. He also distinguished between veins and arteries, noting that the latter pulse and the former do not. Thus, while working at the medical school of Alexandria, Herophilius placed intelligence in the brain based on his surgical exploration of the body and he connected the nervous system to motion and sensation. In addition, he and his contemporary, Erastiasus of Shiros, continued to research the role of veins and nerves. After conducting exclusive, extensive research, the two Alexandrians mapped out the course of the veins and nerves across the human body. Erastiasus connected the increased complexity of the surface of the human brain compared to the other animals to its superior intelligence. He sometimes employed experiments to further his research, at one time repeatedly weighing a caged bird and noting its weight loss between feeding times. In his physiology, air enters the body, it's drawn into the lungs, uh, into the heart, where it's transformed into vital spirit and then pumped into the arteries throughout the body. Some of this vital spirit reaches the brain, where it is transformed into the animal spirit, where it's then distributed to the nerves. Now, our, our dearly beloved Romans. Romans. 
Romans invented numerous surgical instruments, including uh, the first instruments unique to women, as well as surgical uses for forceps, scalpels, cautery, cross-bladed scissors, the surgical needle, the sound, and speculas. Romans also performed cataract surgery. Mm. The Roman surgeon, uh, army physician, Dioscorides, was a Greek botanist and pharmacologist. He wrote the Encyclopedia de Matara Medica, describing over 600 herbal cures, forming an influential pharmacopoeia, which was used extensively for the following 1,500 years. And the early Christians in the Roman Empire incorporated this into their theology, ritual practices, and metaphors. Now, moving forward, in the post-classical, uh, Byzantine medicine came on the scene around uh, 400 Common Era to 1453. Uh, Byzantine medicine was notable for the building upon the knowledge base developed by Greco-Roman predecessors in preserving medical practices from antiquity. Byzantine medicine influenced Islamic medicine as well as fostering Western rebirth of medicine during the Renaissance. Byzantine physicians often compiled and standardized medical knowledge into textbooks. Their records tended to include both diagnostic explanations and technical drawings. The medical compendium and seven books written by the leading physician Paul of Agena survived as a particularly thorough source of medical knowledge. This compendium, written in the late 7th century, remained as a standard textbook for the following 800 years. Wow. Yeah. Late antiquity ushered in a revolution in medical science. Historical records often mention civilian hospitals, Although battlefield medicine and wartime triage were recorded well before Imperial Rome, Constantinople stood out as the center of medicine during the Middle Ages, which was aided by the crossroads location, wealth, and accumulated knowledge. Now, the first ever known example of separating conjoined twins occurred in the Byzantine Empire in the 10th century. The next example of separating conjoined twins uh, will be the first recorded many centuries later in Germany in 1689. Mm. Now, the Byzantine emperor's neighbors, the Persian uh, Sassanid Empire, and their noteworthy contri contributions, mainly with the establishment of the Academy of God and Shapur, <coughs> which was the most important medical center of the ancient world during the 6th and 7th centuries. In addition, Cyril Elbid, British physician and historian of medicine in the Persian area, commented that he thinks that he, he that thanks to medical centers you know, like the Academy of God from her, to a very large extent, the credit of the whole hospital system must be given to Persia. Now, Islamic civilization rode to primacy in medical science and it, as its physicians continued to significantly to the field of medicine, including anatomy, ophthalmology, pharmacology, pharmacy, physiology, and surgery. Islamic civilization's contribution to these fields within medicine was a gradual process that took hundreds of years. During the time of the first great Muslim dynasty, the Umayyad Caliphate, these fields that were very early stages of development, not much progress was made. One reason for the limited advancement of in medicine during the Umayyad Caliphate was the Caliphate's focus on expansion after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. The focus on expansionism redirected resources from other fields, such as medicine. The priority on these factors led to a dense amount of the population who believed that God will provide cures for their illnesses and diseases because of the attention on spirituality. Uh, this is also where I take a giggle a little bit because uh, it always seemed to be that in times of war, there was never a shortage of bodies. Nope. And, you know, obviously somebody's got to patch these poor folks up and then, heaven forbid, send them back into battle. Well, just me. Um, there are also mari a myriad of other areas of interest during the time in which a rising interest in the field of medicine. Abd al-Malik Ibn Marwan, the fifth caliph of the Umayyad, developed a government administration, adopting Arabic as the main language and focused on many other areas. However, this rising interest in Islamic medicine grew significantly with the Abbasid Caliphate overthrew the Umayyad Caliphate in 750 Common Era. This change in the dynasty from the Umayyad Caliphate to the Abbasid Caliphate 
served as a turning point towards scientific and medical developments. A big contributor to this is because under Abbasid rule, there was a great part of the Greek legacy that was transmitted into Arabic and by then the main language of the Islamic nations. Because of this, many Islamic physicians were heavily influenced by the works of Greek scholars in Alexandria and Egypt and were able to further expand on those texts to produce new medical pieces of knowledge. This period of time is known as the Islamic Golden Age and there were a period of developments for development and flourishment of technology, commerce, and sciences, including medicine. Additionally, during the time of the creation of the first Islamic hospital in 805 Common Era by the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad was recounted as a glorious event of the Golden Age. This hospital in Baghdad contributed immensely to Baghdad's success and provided educational opportunities for Islamic physicians. During the Islamic Golden Age, there were many famous Islamic physicians that paved the way for medical advancements and understandings. Now, Muhammad ibn Zarqaya al-Razi, uh, 965-1040 Common Era, sometimes is referred to the father as modern optics. He is the author of the monumental Book of Optics and is sometimes known for his work differentiating smallpox from measles. However, this would not be possible without the influence of many different parts of the world that influence the Arabs. The Arabs were influenced by ancient Indian, Persian, Greek, Roman, and Byzantine medical practices and helped develop them further. Galen and Hippocrates were preeminent authorities. This translation of 129 of Galen's works into, Ara into Arabic by the Nestorian Christian Hunan ibn Ishraq and his assistance, in particular Galen's insistence on a rational systematic approach to medicine, set the template for Islamic medicine, which rapidly spread through the Arab Empire. Its most famous physicians included the Persian polymath Muhammad ibn Zarqiya al-Razi and Avicenna, who wrote that more than 40 works on health, medicine, and well-being. Well -being. Taking leads from uh, Greek and Roman Islamic scholars kept both the art and science of medicine alive and moving forward. Persian polymath Avicenna has also been called the father of medicine. He wrote the Canon of Medicine, which became a standard medical text at many medieval universities and considered one of the more famous books in the history of medicine. The Canon of Medicine provides an overview of contemporary medical knowledge of the medieval Islamic world, which had been influenced by earlier traditions, including Greco-Roman medicine, uh, Persian medicine, Chinese medicine, and Indian medicine. Uh, Persian physician Al-Razi was one of the first to question the Greek theory of humorism, which nevertheless remained influential in both Western, medieval Western, and medieval Islamic medicine. Some volumes of Al-Razi's work, Al-Mansuri, namely on surgery and a general book on therapy, became part of the medical curriculum in European universities. Additionally, he had been called a doctor's doctor, the father of pediatrics, and a pioneer of ophthalmology. For example, he was one of the first uh, to recognize the reaction of an eye's pupil to light. Now, in addition to the contributions to humanity's understanding of human anatomy, uh, Islamic Scientists and scholars, physicians specifically, played an invaluable role in the development of <clears throat> the modern hospital system, creating the foundations on which more contemporary medical professionals would build models of public health systems in Europe and elsewhere. During the time of the Safed Empire in 16th to 18th centuries in Iran and the Mughal Empire in 16th to 19th centuries in India, Muslim scholars radically transformed the inst institution of a hospital creating an environment in which rapidly developed medical knowledge at the time could be passed among students and teachers from a wide range of cultures. There were two main schools of thought uh, with patient care at the time. These included humor physiology from the Persians and Ayurvedic practice. After these theories were translated from Sanskrit to Persian and vice versa, hospitals could have a mix of culture and techniques. This this allowed for a sense of collaborative medicine. Hospitals became increasingly common during the per period as wealthy patrons commonly founded them. 
Many features that are still in use today, such as an emphasis on hygiene, a staff fully dedicated to the care of patients, and a separation of individual patients from each other, were developed in Islamic hospitals long before they came to practice in Europe. At that time, the patient care aspects of hospitals in Europe had not taken effect. European hospitals were places of religion rather than the institutions of science, as was the case with much of the scientific work done by Islamic scholars. Many of these novel developments of medical practice were transmitted to European cultures hundreds of years after they've been long used throughout the Islamic world. Although Islamic scientists are responsible for discovering much of the knowledge that allows hospital systems to function safely today, European scholars who built this work still receive the majority of the credit historically. Now, before the development of scientific medical practices in Islamic empires, medical care was mainly performed by religious figures such as priests. What? Without a profounding understanding of how infectious diseases worked and why sickness spread from person to person, these early attempts at caring for the ill and injured often did more harm than good. Contrarily, the development of new and safer practices by scholars and physicians in Arabian hospitals, ideas vital for the effective care of patients, was developed, learned, and transmitted widely. Hospitals developed no novel concepts and structures which are still in use today, separate wards for male and female patients, pharmacies, medical record keeping, and personal and institutional sanitation and hygiene. Much of this knowledge was recorded and passed on through uh, medical texts, many of which were carried to Europe and translated for the use by European medical workers. The Tasrif, written by surgeon Abu al-Askim al-Zahari, was translated into Latin. It became one of the most, uh, most important medical texts in European universities during the Middle Ages and contained useful information on surgical techniques and the spread of bacterial infection. Now, the hospital was a typical institution that included a majority of Muslim cities, and although they were often physically attached to religious institutions, they were not themselves places of religious practice. Rather, they served as facilities to which education and scientific innovation could flourish. If they had been places of wor worship, they had been secondary to the medical side of the hospital. Uh, Islamic hospitals, along with the observatories used for astronomical science, were some of the most important points of exchange for the spread of scientific knowledge. Undoubtedly, the hospital system developed in the Islamic world played an invaluable role in the creation and evol evolution of hospitals as a society as we know today. Now, in, after 400 Common Era, the study and practice of medicine in Western Roman Empire went into a deep decline. Medical services were provided, especially for the poor, in thousands of monastery hospitals that sprang up across Europe, but the care was rudimentary and mostly palliative. Most of the writings of Galen and Hippocrates were lost in the West, with the summaries and comprenda of St. Isidore of Seville being the primary channel of transmitting Greek medical ideas. The Carolingian Renaissance brought uh, increased contact with Byzantium and a greater awareness of ancient medicine, but only with the 12th century Renaissance and the new translations coming from Muslim and Jewish sources in Spain and the 15th century flood of resources after the fall of Constantinople, did the West fully recover its uh, acquaintance with classical antiquity. Uh, Greek and Roman taboos meant that the dissection was usually banned in ancient times, but in the Middle Ages it changed. Medical teachers and students at Bologna began to open human bodies, and Monino di Luzzi produced the first known anatomy textbook based on human dissection. Wallace identifies the prestige hierarchy with university-educated physicians at top, followed by learned surgeons, craft-trained surgeons, barber surgeons, itinerant specialists such as dentists and oculists, empirics, and midwives. Now, the first medical schools that were opened in the 9th century, most notably the Scola Medica Salterina at Salerno in southern Italy, the cosmopolitan influences from Greek, Latin, Arabic, and Hebrew sources, <coughs> gave it an international reputation as a Hippocratic city. Students from wealthy families came for three years of preliminary studies and five of medical studies. The medicine, following the laws of Federico II, were founded in 1224, the university, and improved by Scuola Sorrentina in a period between 1200 and 1400. 
It had in Sicily, so-called Sicilian Middle Ages, a particular development so much to create a true school of Jewish medicine. As a result of which, after a legal examination, was conferred a Jewish Sicilian woman, Verde Murrah, wife of another physician, Pascal of Catalina, the historical record of before women officially trained to exercise the medical profession at the University of Bologna. The training of physicians began in 1219. The Italian city attracted students from across Europe. Uh, Tato Alderon Alatori built a tradition of medical education that established the characteristic features of an Italian learned medicine and was copied by medical schools elsewhere. Uh, Turistatus was his student in 1320, uh, we'll call it A.D., modern time. Uh, University of Pauda was founded in 1220 by walkouts from the University of Bologna and began teaching medicine in 1222. It played a leading role in its identification of treatment of diseases and ailments, specializing in autopsies and inner workings of the body. Starting in 1595, Pauda's famous atomical theater drew artists and scientists studying the human body during public dissections. The intensive study of Galen led to the critiques of Galen modeled on his own writing, as in the first book of Velasius' De Humani Corpus Fabrica. Uh, Velasius has held the chair of surgery in anatomy, and in 1543 published the anatomical discoveries in the Humani Corpus Fabrica. He portrayed the human body as an independent system of organ groupings. The book trigger meant a uh, great public interest in dissections and caused many other European cities to establish anatomical theaters. What a great way to learn. There's the body. Look at it. Study it. Memorize it. And by the 13th century, medical school at Montpelier began to eclipse the Salternian school. In the 12th century, universities were founded in Italy, France, and England, and soon developed schools of medicine. <clears throat> the University of Montpellier in France and Italy's University of Pauda and the University of Bologna were leading schools, and nearly all of the learning was from lectures and readings in Hippocrates, Galen, Avicenna, and Aristotle. In later centuries, the importance of universities founded in the late uh, Middle Ages gradually increased. Uh, example, Charles University in Prague, Jacqueline University in Krakow, the University of Vienna, Heidelberg University, and the University in Gesswald. Uh, and in 1376 in Sicily, here's one for my daughter. Historically given, the relationship to the laws of Frederico II that they foresaw the examination with the regal errand of phys uh, physicists, the first qualification to the exercise of the medicine to a woman, Vedemira, a Jewish woman of Catalina, whose document is preserved in Palermo, the first woman of medicine in the Italian National Archives, 1376. Ooh. Now, as time went along, uh, we'll speed this up a little bit so you guys can go have lunch. Um, yeah, we're at 50 minutes already. Yeah. The way science was, was, was progressing, um, obviously with, uh, you know, they had opened up North America south america to exploration uh when you looked at you know places on the east coast uh bigger cities were being formed you know philadelphia washington dc boston uh and then as people started coming across the united states uh a couple things that were always kind of funny to me just reflecting back to south dakota uh the first hospital we actually had here in west river came in at Deadwood. It was set up by a group of nuns. And then, interestingly enough, a second set of nuns left Deadwood, came down to Rapid City. And with all the, 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 the knowledge and stuff that they had, their first hospital was a house. And it was, you know, I've seen pictures of it. It's little, it's quaint. It had like maybe eight rooms. Uh, until they were able to build the first regular hospital in South Rapid. Um, but the, the, the two things that always dawned on me that were kind of funny is that in some of the more rural areas, uh, let's take the Northern Hills, 
Uh, Belfouche had a hospital. Uh, Spearfish had a small hospital. And Deadwood had its hospital. But one of the things I was studying was in the uh, county of Harding. Okay, at one time Butte was was huge. You know, it it encompassed three separate uh, county areas. And what would happen is is that okay, you had one city, you had uh, Crook City, which is like right next to the state of Montana. Uh, you had about eight to ten small towns. You know, they weren't very big. They might have had a, a general store, a post office, a school, uh, maybe a dance hall. But they didn't have any medical facilities. Well, what they did almost reminds you of something like the uh, Pony Express. Let's say you were up in the town of Riva. And all of a sudden somebody starts, you know, complaining of a stomach ailment or somebody got kicked by a horse. Well, what they would do is that they would send a runner on horseback. Didn't matter the weather. It could be 10 feet of snow. Which it, probably happened. It could yeah, more than a few times. And this person would ride down to what is now present-day uh, Hoover. He would stop there. He would get a fresh horse. He would take off again. And then he would ride from Hoover usually all the way down to Belfouche. From there, he would contact the local doctor, and then either he would get another horse or a buggy, and then they would turn around and come back the same way. And usually the turnaround time, you know, even though this was a round-trip 250-mile ride, they would do that. And it was how they managed to keep, you know, those small towns... You know, if they needed a doctor. The other aspect that was always kind of uh, interesting to me was that, uh, and I'd, I'd read this in one of the books, they had a guy who actually got kicked by a horse in the back. And <laughs> apparently these guys have to be either a lot more hardy than we are today, or, you know, he didn't think he was that badly hurt. This guy had broken his back. I think I remember that story. And he decided that he was going to walk into North Dakota and see the doctor. Because why not? You know, I mean, it, when you don't have a doctor, you go only, to the doctor. It's only 15 miles, you know, nothing to worry about. Deal. So he went up there, and he got checked out, and the guy said, Oh, it, you're okay, your back's not broken, you know, you're okay. Just take some, you know, some aspirin, you know, stay off your feet for a, a week. Well, Take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Yeah, he, he wasn't getting any better. So finally he went back north again with his family's help and went into Montana. And the guy said, by gosh, golly, yes, you did break your back. And so he was laid up for almost two months. <coughs> but, you know, it, it's because one of those every things. every doctor is an expert. Yeah, you know. But it's, it's, it's one of these things that, you know, you look and you wonder how these towns survived... Um, Magic. We did read a thing about a uh, a couple that was living in a town called Twilight. Hey, <laughs> um, and what was crazy is is that the uh, there was a, a couple that were running the town store, and one night in the middle of a snowstorm, the wife started getting really sick. Well, like our true hero, he bundled her up, got her in the the wagon. And they rode from Twilight down to Newell. Never returned. It was pretty much the end of that town. Because, well, he was the only one that ran the store, and off they went. But it was one of the features that happens with some of these towns, is that if you don't have access to medical facilities, and, you know, you happen to be the type that need medical help more often than not, you Sometimes move. that was the appeal. Yeah, you you would wind up packing up, and as the schools would shut down and the post offices would close, you would look for places that you know life was a little bit easier, and that's what these people were doing. But we may have a part two on the section dealing with 17th and 18th century medicine later. But 
Uh, this has been the Bearded Historian. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, uh, paper 206, uh, I'll sign off on college credits. Uh, the Bearded Historian saying good evening, folks. Good night. Oh, my phone is super